Hi, it's me. Over the past two or three years, I have had endless requests to retest a classic Sigma lens, the 18 to 35 mm f1.8 art. While I can't always reply to every comment I get on my YouTube channel nowadays because I get 20 or 30 a day, I do pay attention to them and so today your wish is my command, and I'd like to thank Sigma UK for loaning me a copy of this lens for a couple of weeks for evaluation. I reluctantly sold my copy of it a few years ago when I started shooting more on full frame cameras. This is just for APS-C. Nevertheless, I'm pleased to be checking out this beautiful and revolutionary lens once again because I have such a happy history with it. It made my favourite 10 lenses of all time list. I took it to South Korea with me back in 2014 to make a documentary about the growth of the church out there on my Canon 70D and it performed like a dream come true on Canon's first dual pixel autofocus camera. I owned a copy of it for several years, and my original review of it has almost three quarters of a million views. Its price of £700 in the UK or US$800 is still quite reasonable for what you're getting here. My subscribers have been asking me to put it through its paces once more on whatever latest camera happened to be available. Well, it doesn't get much better than the new Canon EOS R7, with its brutally demanding 32.5 megapixel APS-C sensor. I'm going to go ahead and do a full review right here, just in case this is a new lens to anyone, but if you just want to see the image quality results on the new camera then obviously just skip ahead in the video. My reviews are deliberately very formulaic, so you can do that easily. Some of the sample pictures you'll see in this review have been taken on other cameras over the years, I thought that might be nice, but obviously the test results a bit later will be from the EOS R7. This thing is designed for digital SLR cameras with an APS-C sized sensor, and it's currently still available for Canon EF mount, Nikon F mount, and Sigma SA mount. But of course, if you have the correct adapter, it works perfectly on mirrorless APS-C cameras, which many, many filmmakers have chosen to do over the years. This has become an absolutely classic lens for filmmaking. With Sigma's excellent MC11 adapter, it will work absolutely beautifully on Sony cameras too. The key thing to remember is that it gives an APS-C image circle, not full frame. Here it is on my Sony full frame camera in full frame mode, and you can see that at 18mm there's very obvious vignetting, although zoom into 35mm and you actually get quite good coverage. When adapted onto both my Sony a7R 3 and my Canon EOS R7 cameras, in-camera corrections were offered, which is great news, and the camera's in-body image stabilisation worked just fine also. Do remember, this lens does not have its own stabilisation. Let's take a look further at the build quality. You can see that this lens is fairly big. It's quite long, but fairly thin. It feels very solid and comfortable to hold in your hand. It's also pretty heavy at 810 grams or nearly two pounds. The zoom ring turns the opposite way from Canon lenses, which originally took me a little getting used to, but it's extremely smooth to turn and precise, and it turns quite heavily, so it feels perfect for video making. The lens also zooms internally, which is a nice touch and helpful if you're using an electronic gimbal. The focus ring is super smooth to turn and well damped, like those classic lenses from the 1960s and 70s, it's extremely precise, great for pulling focus during video work. As a lens with an older ultrasonic motor, it has full time manual focusing, so you can enjoy turning that focus ring even if it's set to autofocus, it's really tactile. The autofocus motor is quite fast and almost completely silent, and it's accurate too. A newer STM motor would be a little more efficient for video work than an ultrasonic one, but I've never encountered serious issues using ultrasonic lenses for video, to be honest with you. As you change focus, the lens does exhibit a small amount of breathing, zooming in and out a little, but not too much. The lens comes with a good quality little plastic hood, and its front filter size is 72mm wide. Overall, still the same beautiful build quality as ever here, with particularly smooth and nicely rubberized control rings for video work. On to image quality. As I mentioned, I'll be giving this lens a huge challenge by adapting it onto my Canon EOS R7 with its rather brutal 32.5 megapixel sensor. Inner camera corrections are turned on. 
at 18mm and f1.8 in the middle of the image, sharpness is very good but not excellent. Contrast is very nice though. Image corners are noticeably soft. Stop down to f2.8 for a small improvement in those corners and back in the middle, picture quality is now razor sharp. The lens stays this sharp down to f8, both in the middle and in the image corners, so it's just an okay start at 18mm. Let's zoom in halfway to 24mm. At f1.8, image quality is a little softer in the middle than before. The corners are deteriorating too. At f2.8, the corners look just a little better, but the middle looks a lot sharper. At f4, the middle is just as good, and over in the corners, we are slowly seeing further improvement. At f5.6 and f8, the corners now look reasonably sharp. Finally, let's zoom all the way into 35mm, where the lens has always traditionally been at its softest, and at f1.8, image quality is indeed a little soft in the middle, and corner image quality is very weak. Stop down to f2.8 and the corners are only marginally better, but the middle of the image becomes very sharp. At f4, image quality in the middle is perfect, but the corners are still rather weak. f5.6 looks a lot better there though, and at f8, we get optimal corner image quality, although if you stop down any further than that, say to f16, then the image just gets softer again due to diffraction. So, on that very demanding 32.5 megapixel sensor, the lens is really showing its age unfortunately, and also unsurprisingly, this kind of sensor does have a habit of chewing up even sharp camera lenses and spitting them back out again. However, the lens will be sharp enough for 4K video work, which is probably the key concern of many video makers who are looking at it. Ok, let's turn off those in-camera corrections and take a look at vignetting and distortion. At 18mm, we see just a little barrel distortion here, but nothing serious. Some vignetting is visible right in the edges, but stop down to only f2.8 and it's largely gone. Zoom into 35mm and that barrel distortion flips into pincushion distortion, and the vignetting at f1.8 is stronger than before. Stop down to f2.8 though and those corners again quickly brighten up. This lens can focus down to about 27cm when you're zoomed in, which gets you very close to your subject, as you can see here. Unfortunately, at f1.8, close-up image quality is very poor. Stop down to f2.8 or f4 for small improvements, but it's only really f5.6 that the close-up image quality becomes any good. Let's take a look now at how this lens performs against bright light. We see a little bit of flaring, and particularly glaring, around the bright point of light itself, which gets just a little worse as you zoom in. It's nothing too serious though. Let's take a look at how the lens handles coma smearing. At f1.8, just a little smearing is visible on bright points of light in the corners of your images, but it's low. Stop down to f2.8 and it's gone. Let's zoom out now and look for sun stars. Those begin to emerge quite nicely at f8, and at f11 and f16, they get fantastically strong. Nice. Now let's take a look at the quality of this lens's bokeh, and this lens deserves to be famous for it, as it's almost always truly beautiful here, even when confronted with quite difficult or complex backgrounds. Finally, related to bokeh comes longitudinal chromatic aberration. Ouch. At f1.8, it's certainly pretty strong here, at f2.8, it's a little more under control, and at f4, there's no problem anymore. Well, there you go. All you people who wanted me to retest this lovely thing, I sure gave you the works, didn't I? As I mentioned before, Canon's 32.5 megapixel APS-C cameras really do chew up even sharper camera lenses and spit them out again, and the wonderful Sigma 18-35mm f1.8 had some trouble here. It'll still be good enough on 24 megapixel cameras, and more than good enough for 4K video work, and it still captures gorgeous images with plenty of charm while handling particularly well for video work, but on the very toughest cameras it struggles. But you know what, I'd absolutely love to see a new version of this lens designed from the ground up for mirrorless cameras. It's been 8 years now, I'd wager Sigma would have no problem sharpening up its image quality a bit and getting its size down a bit too, and an STM autofocus motor might be handy on top of that for video work, just imagine, I'd love to see it. You know what? 
I both love and hate that 32.5 megapixel Canon sensor. I did loads of tests with a similar one on a Canon EOS M6 Mark II a couple of years ago, and it just destroys all but the very sharpest camera lenses. It's a hungry beast for sure. Anyway, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon. Thanks to you, this channel is still going, and supporters over there get all kinds of exclusive bonus content too. Check it out in the description below, and ciao for now.